about. <laughs> and I'm so tired of pandemic and uh, Trump and all of that baloney that uh, I'm, I'm getting, so I just don't care. I'm just happy that I can show up anywhere, even on Zoom. Okay, so hello, and thank you to everyone for being here today and joining us this afternoon. This is the first virtual Facing Resistance speaker series for Level. My name is Shalan Marcus. I'm the executive director of Level, and we have some wonderful speakers today who are going to share their thoughts on today's topic, which is Canada's access to justice crisis and its effects on marginalized youth. Level is a charitable organization. Our mission is to disrupt prejudice, build empathy, and advance human rights. I want to thank our sponsors for supporting this event, Blake's LLP, Tory's LLP, Krista Hill and Linda Plumpton, Goodman's LLP, Enbridge and Weirfolds, as well as CN. Thank you for your support of our organization and this very important conversation. I'm going to run through the agenda right now for the event and just lay some ground rules. So first, We'll be doing the welcome, which is happening right now. Constance Simmons, Métis Senator, is going to be doing our land acknowledgement and opening prayer. Then I'll share a few words to contextualize the topic. And then we'll start with a panel discussion with Maggie Wente and Anthony Morgan. We're very excited to have them here today. And then we'll engage in a brief Q&A where attendees will be able to pose their questions and we'll go over some of that together. And then Justice Jody Lynn Wadi Love will be joining us to share her personal story. And then we'll go through some closing remarks and Constance will be sharing some words then. So feel free to use the Zoom chat and the question function to engage in a respectful discussion. Um, for the speakers, we've talked about this before, just mute yourself uh, when someone else is speaking. And this event will be partially recorded and we will make efforts to share it after the event for anyone who missed it. We're also streaming right now on Facebook Live. So you can go to our Facebook page, uh, our Level Justice Facebook page and view it there for anyone who wants to watch that way. So with that, I'm going to introduce Métis Senator Constance Simmons, who will begin with an opening prayer and land acknowledgement. I want to start by just giving a bit of a background, a brief, a brief, brief background on Constance. So Constance is a Métis woman from Northern Saskatchewan, Treaty 6 territory. She is Cree and Scottish. She has served as a Métis Senator for the Toronto and York Region Métis Council, Constance has served the Indigenous community for 40 years, specializing in complex addiction and mental health issues, both in BC and Ontario. Constance has also served as a Métis representative for the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Inquiry, and as an elder for the Indigenous Advisory Youth Council at the Law Society of Ontario. She has also been a consultant with the U of T Faculty of Law Indigenous Studies Unit, and a consultant with the Indigenous Unit at Women's College Hospital. She is a mother of two and a grandmother of two. Constance, thank you for being here today. Hey, Gwich, it's my pleasure to be joining all of you and I extend to you uh, warm greetings. I want to say tansé, sego, bonjour, ani, and bonjour. Uh, I am really honored to be present with you. Uh, the passion in my heart is uh, is for youth justice, well, justice for all. Um, so I have 40 years in addictions, mental health. I did some of that in forensics and forensic psychiatrics. So I just want to share with you that I have been on the front lines for decades and so my heart is with the disenfranchised youth uh, and the displaced youth. And uh, my passion is to reach out to 
to, to find solidarity so that us who are privileged to serve and us who are privileged to have had that exposure to academic education and therefore have the right to sit at larger tables and voice a, a, an informed opinion that we join together and standing, I know that standing together uh, to remove barriers and to create safety for our youth is, is part of a life's journey. It's part of legacy and it's part of responsibility for, thus, for those of us who have uh, gained knowledge and academic standing, uh, standing in society, uh, we have also re great responsibility with that. So on that note, I would like to open in prayer. So as you can see, I've lit the medicines here in my smudge bowl. I have the sage burning. And I have my tobacco. Tobacco is uh, how we lay down our intention, which is called a prayer. So I'm smudging off my tobacco. I'm lifting it up and I'm saying, oh, get some mana too. Wapi me ingwen kwe disnika makwadodam, Treaty Six Territories of Northern Saskatchewan. I say to you from my heart, creator, that I am White Wolf Woman, named by uh, my elder, Harry Snowboy, that I am Bear Clan, and that uh, I come from the area of Northern Saskatchewan around Batoche and Prince Albert. And uh, I'm uh, so pleased to be standing here before you, creator, thanking you for this day and saying to you, Creator, that I acknowledge that each day is a new beginning. And in that uh, each day is our, therein lies our great hope as human beings. And saying to you, Creator, thank you that uh, we can be gathered together on uh, sacred territories of our Indigenous people across Turtle Island. And that for the most part, uh, I acknowledge that we are guests on these uh, sacred territories of our ancestors and would ask uh, that the ancestors of all these sacred territories would uh, surround us, would press down on our hearts, would uh, give us vision, would strike that fire in our heart that we can walk forward remembering always and honoring always the ancestors that walk before us. And in doing that, uh, cast our eyes and our visions forward uh, to our future, not for our children, not just for our children and our grandchildren, but lo, seven generations forward, where those youth will stand in our footprints and remember us as ancestors, remember that how we walk this land, what we stood up for. And I'm thanking you, Creator, for all you provide to us through our Mother, the Earth. And in particular, Creator, I am holding up the sacred water that sustains all life and wish to honor the water at this time. That water that sustains all life, that sacred water that our women carry that bring our children to us. That sacred water that is our tears that we shed that is so important to our, uh, our well-being and our mental health, that there is no shame in those sacred tears. They help us to grow. They help us to connect with our spirit. And we uh, are ever so grateful to that. And uh, saying to you, Creator, as we talk about these matters at hand here today, that we be joined as one heart, one vision, and uh, that vision is for our disenfranchised youth. Uh, and that uh, the discussion would be uh, lively and invigorated. That our guest speakers uh, would be well in their spirit and that they would be calm and speak from their hearts in their authentic voices so that we may hear and feel 
the passion for these things to be that we're talking about. For myself, creator, I would ask that uh, if any of my words or deeds are stumbling to anybody or hurtful or harmful in any way, creator, I acknowledged before you that I am but a pitiful creature. And the only desire in my heart, creator, is to serve your people. So I humble myself before you and ask the ancestors to walk with me and guide my footsteps. And uh, that I use the maturity of my 70 years, that I learn to hold my tongue, that I learn to listen with my full listening skills, that I take into my heart the things being said, and that when I speak, I speak uh, in the intention of this tobacco that we are burning here today. I say, Creator, I drink this water, this sacred water for all of us and for all of Mother Earth. And ask Creator that the ancestor help us to stand up for Mother Earth and stand up for the water. I say to you and to the ancestors, Matakuyash, all my relations, hi hi. So I'm now burning the tobacco. That is the contract that we have before Creator and with one another. That intention is laid out in the tobacco. And I am taking the cedar, which is another very sacred medicine, and I'm laying it on top of the burning tobacco. So the sweet fragrance of our prayer is present and uh, creator and our ancestors are a witness to how we conduct ourselves here today. I say thank you, I'm honored to be in your presence and I will now put myself on mute. Miigwech. Thank you, Constance. We feel very lucky to have you here today and at this point, I'm just going to share a few words on this topic today. And I want to provide a disclaimer. This is a difficult topic and it brings up some challenging feelings. But I do want this talk to be a lot about hope and solutions. And we have wonderful speaker, speakers here today who are going to share about how we can walk forward and create a justice system that is responsive, balanced, and fair. Our topic today explores Canada's access to justice crisis and its effects on marginalized youth. And the reason we chose this topic is because despite representing 8% of the Canadian youth population in Canada, Indigenous youth make up 48% of youth admissions to custody. Statistics from the John Howard Society show that Black people are overrepresented in federal prisons by more than 300% versus their population. For Indigenous people, the overrepresentation over is nearly 500%. The reasons for barriers to justice are complex, but the lack of culturally appropriate educational programming coupled with the effects of systemic racism and colonialism are widely recognized as significant issues. We believe that in order to combat discrimination and create an equitable justice system, we must invest in the capacity to elevate empathy intercultural awareness and humility. This starts with events like this, where legal professionals and communities can come together and strive to learn new ways to connect and create a more culturally responsive and diverse justice system. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. We'll now start the panel portion of the event. Our first panelist is Maggie Wente. I had the privilege of watching Maggie uh, last year speak, and I'm very excited to have her join our event today. 
I'm just going to provide a brief bio on Maggie. Maggie is a partner at OKT. She is a member of Serpent River First Nation. Maggie has a broad practice serving First Nation governments, their related entities, businesses, and non-for-profit corporations. Maggie advises on treaty and Aboriginal rights in litigation and negotiation, human rights of Indigenous people, and, partic and in particular, equality of First Nation children and individuals in programs and services, in particular in the child welfare system. Maggie also advises in Indian Act matters, reserve land management, and First Nations governance. Maggie, thank you for being here today. Can you share a few thoughts on the topic and what it means to, means to you? So Canada's access to justice crisis and its effects on marginalized youth. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. And I want to thank and acknowledge the elder for her words this morning, which are, I guess, this afternoon, which were uh, inspiring to me. So um, when I think about the question of access to justice, I think that this is something that um, is often framed in the question of sort of access to courts or access to lawyers. And I, I mean, I'm not a I'm not a criminal lawyer at all. I work a lot on policy matters, uh, and so uh, policy matters with respect to equality for First Nations children and families in uh, the child welfare system. And I really come to this kind of question with that lens, and I look at the problem, I suppose, of um, overrepresentation of Indigenous and Black youth, and there's a lot of similarities in the criminal justice system as one ultimately being a question of um, like, do these, do these people have fair childhoods and do they have just childhoods? And I think that for me, that is really overwhelmingly something that I've seen. I have a social work degree as well. And I, again, I'm not like a practicing social worker at all, but um, you know, I do read quite a bit of social work literature and, um, and sociological literature in terms of trying to get at uh, these problems of inequality. And to me, I mean, I think by the time we have a youth who is, at the doorstep of the criminal justice system who's an accused offender, like we've already really failed that person. And so to me, I feel like the question ought to be like, what is, in what ways have we failed that person? And in what ways can we think about trying to remedy the failure? Because um, you can have all of the lawyers in the world and you, know, you can have all of the courts in the world and there can be great excellent legal representation for people who find themselves accused of crimes and youth who find themselves accused of crimes. And the question is like, does that system work? And I think that that system doesn't work. Um, I think we know the system doesn't work. People are black youth and indigenous youth are overrepresented and they don't have good outcomes coming out of a, 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 the juvenile justice system in any event. It just leads to a cycle of criminality for adults. And so when I think about what that problem is, and I've gone back to look at human rights reports and other reports in academic literature, I mean, one of the things that is very prevalent to me and very obvious to lots of people is that that's, uh, lots of people who are in the child welfare system end up in the criminal justice system as youth. And, um, and so we know that youth uh, in the child protection system are also, uh, Indigenous and Black communities are overrepresented in that system. And so to me, I mean, I think my perspective is much more about like looking about uh, solving this problem is much more about how do we give just lives to Black and Indigenous youth? And how do we look at the causes of what's, um, what's putting people into a system or getting them in, in front of the criminal justice system? So one of those things is child welfare. You know, addictions and mental health are those are, are, are other things, and those things are you know related. And you know, the having had adverse childhood experiences, that's something that you know gets people into the criminal justice system. And all of those things are really wound up in child protection. And then, I mean, I think for me, I then want to like look back again further. At why do people end up in child protection? It's not that these children are divorced from um, having had a family. They had a family, and the family was. Uh, you know, arguably struggling, well, the family is struggling probably to take care of them. And I don't want to say that in all instances, because certainly not in all instances where someone ends up away from their family, are they, it, it doesn't mean their family couldn't take care of them. It just meant that the system didn't provide enough support possibly for their family to take care of them. Um, and so, 
and the child protection system also isn't working. And we know that and indigenous communities have been saying that for since child protection arrived in indigenous communities in the 60s in Ontario. And I think black communities probably have similar uh, similar things. And one of the things that to me is important about that or that is necessary about that is we don't, child protection legislation isn't actually really motivated at all by, by sociological research or social work research about what is uh, gonna lead to better outcomes for children and families. And so to me, I think one of the ways to kind of get it or the way to get at the nut of this problem is to think about how, um, how we can make for much more just lives for children and families and really that involves going back to look at the circumstances that are leading children and families and young people to be in situations where they're struggling and are you know getting to a point where they may be committing sort of crimes or getting involved in the justice system so to me ultimately it's a question about social justice and not as much of a question about access to justice i think at that point, it's it's probably a little bit too late. So I know I'm conscious I'm not supposed to talk too much because then Anthony and I are going to have a big dialogue. So I'll let Anthony go ahead. Thanks, Maggie. So now I'm going to introduce our second panelist, Anthony Morgan. Again, very lucky to have Anthony here. I've been following Anthony's work for a while. And I'll provide a brief bio for him. Although both our panelists have very long bios, they have a lot of accomplishments, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. Anthony Morgan is the manager of the City of Toronto's Confronting Anti-Black Racism Unit. This unit is responsible for the implementation of the Toronto Action Plan to Confront Anti-Black Racism. Additionally, Anthony maintains a separate practice providing various services, including human rights, education, legal research and analysis. In his career, Anthony advocated on matters related to anti-Black racism in Canada at various levels of court. He has appeared before the Supreme Court of Canada and before two United Nations Human Rights Committees in Geneva, Switzerland. He was nominated for Canada's top 25 influential lawyers by Canadian Lawyer Magazine in 2016 and 17. Anthony's writing and commentary on issues concerning race and racism, critical multiculturalism and critical race theory in Canada have been featured on CBC, CTV and Global, as well as the Globe and Mail, National Post, Toronto Star and CNN. Anthony, thanks for being here today. And I would love to hear your thoughts on what does Canada's access to justice crisis and its effects on mar marginalized youth mean to you? Well, first, thank you. I want to uh, also acknowledge the, the elder uh, conference for uh, opening us up appropriately and recentering us for the conversation. And, and for me, I, it, it, when we have the conversation about uh, access to justice, like Maggie had, had spoken to, there are so many ways in which systems fail our young people before it comes to direct intervention with the courts. But one of the things that I don't think we talk about enough when it comes to policymakers, lawyers, actors in the justice system more generally is frankly stereotypes around Black and Indigenous youth and how deeply stereotypes impact how we organize resources, how we support or do not support these young people. So. When it comes to Black and Indigenous youth, rarely are they given the opportunity to be seen, heard, and supported as themselves, as individuals, while still having their, their histories, cultures, and experience honored. Instead, what we have, because of media messaging and what's not taught in schools about uh, Black history and Indigenous uh, histories, we have a number of tropes that end up informing consciously and unconsciously decision makers. And so, those decision makers could have significant impact on young people's lives. So that could be teachers themselves who were not uh, properly schooled in understanding the complex realities of Indigenous and Black uh, communities and youth. Uh, that could also be child welfare workers uh, who also were not given that education and it was not made a priority for all folks working within that system to understand the nuances and complexities. Uh, it could be police uh, officers. Could be healthcare workers. 
you have the full range and gamut of, of folks. So that's not an exhaustive list, but by and large, we have collectively been miseducated about who Indigenous people are, who Black people are, especially our Black and Indigenous youth. And so there are stereotypes about uh, Black and Indigenous youth being involved in all kinds of uh, bad or nefarious negative activities or being prone to violence or uh, just having this total disregard for the, the rules of society. Now, people could say that, well, that's, that's kind of how we see all youth. To some extent, that's true, but the impact is not the same. When we look at the dramatic uh, overrepresentation of, of uh, Indigenous and Black youth in police contact. So for many um, years, we we're having this conversation around, around carding. So the practice of police stopping, questioning, and documenting youth, we see dramatic disparities there for Black and Indigenous youth. Same thing for uh, high school suspensions and expulsions. Wherever we're collecting that data, it shows that there are excessively elevated rates of suspension and expulsion for Indigenous and Black youth child welfare apprehension. Similarly, you have alarmingly high rates of overrepresentation. And so I'm, I'm pointing to all those things to show that, that even if we, we collectively want to stop and say, well, everybody sort of sees youth as, as uh, rebels and um, sometimes involved in activities that they shouldn't as part of young people in developing, the, the, the challenge for Black and Indigenous youth is often that they're not given the same opportunities to be kids or to grow as young people, to make mistakes and to be supported, to develop, uh, to make better decisions in their lives. Instead, there tends to be what I, I refer to and other scholars and, and, and actors in the system have referred to as a criminalization uh, of uh, both Black and Indigenous youth, which then, even if we're not talking about the criminal justice system, that notion of criminalization, so participating in activities that if another person did, it would just be seen as uh, just regular activity, but when a Black and Indigenous person does it, there becomes a suspicion of crime. Uh, an example of this could be uh, clothing style. So let, if we talk about the influence of hip hop culture uh, and, and rap music, there's a lot of Black and Indigenous young people who like to take on that aesthetic, the clothes, the hats, even the posturing. And they, when they do it, although it can be fun and interesting in a way for them to express themselves, they end up coming under a shroud of suspicion. Are they crime involved? Do they hang out with gangs? What kind of negative activities are they up to? Whereas folks who are not Black and Indigenous, they don't feel that and they don't experience the same kinds of pressures. It's not that they experience none of that criminalization, but overwhelmingly Black and Indigenous community uh, and our young people especially are, are uh, what I refer to as criminalized because of that. And so for me, when it comes to access to justice, we have to fundamentally reshape how we socialize ourselves to think about Black and Indigenous youth. What are the experiences? What are the histories that have led our young people to find themselves where they are in the family conditions and communities that they have? And until we do that, we're at risk of simply perpetuating the disadvantages in various uh, systems. Thank you, Anthony. So, Anthony and Maggie, you've, you've both touched on this uh, in your introduction of the topic. Can you share what you see as, as some of the significant barriers for marginalized youth, particularly Indigenous and Black youth? And I think you've both touched on this in different ways, but can we hone in on what are those barriers so that we can start to figure out how to influence and change them? And Maggie, maybe you wanna start and then Anthony, you can follow. We can we can follow that. I mean, I think it's something that Anthony had really referred to as well. And I would welcome you, Shailen, to ask Constance to weigh in on it. Obviously, she has a wealth of experience as well. So, um, I mean, to me, I think that, that one of the key barriers, I, there's one of the things I think is that the system that is theoretically designed to help these youth is not designed by people who have any real knowledge of um, the, the conditions and circumstances of these youth. And it's a system, frankly, designed by white people in order to correct a problem that is primarily experienced by non-white people. And I, to me, that's like just a very significant barrier in terms of that system 
working in any way that's going to positively affect the lives of the people who are wrapped up in it. So for instance, one of the things that we've had for a very long time is that the child protection system is um, embedded completely with culturally based assumptions about what are the correct ways to raise children and what the correct practices are about raising children and holding standards to families that frankly almost nobody meets. Um, and when you design a system like that without taking into account the circumstances of various people and the worldviews of various people and how people view children and view parenting about children, you're already setting that family up to fail. And I'd say also that the correctional system or the criminal justice system is the same way. It's embedded in frankly a quite old model of how we believe we correct human behavior, which I don't think any, I mean, I don't think anybody really seriously defends the notion that like jail is supposed to somehow rehabilitate people or make people better or that youth detention would rehabilitate youth and make them better and make them into productive adults. But there's a real societal resistance, I think, to changing any of these systems um, for reasons that, you know, I don't, they're, you know, not known to me really, I don't know, but it's embedded, frankly, in, you know, this desire for social control or resistance to change, et cetera. And so, to me, like the system design and the fact that the system that's supposed to be helping people is hurting them and it's designed, frankly, without their input or without any real um, empirical evidence about what would help them. So to me, that's a, a very serious barrier. Anthony. Yeah, for, so I, I, I fully agree with uh, everything that, that Maggie uh, has, has shared. And I would uh, also add that if we speak very specifically to rates of, of poverty, child poverty and underemployment, it becomes much clearer why the uh, challenges of access to justice are what they are. And we have these elevated rates of, of poverty, unemployment and underemployment uh, in indigenous and, and black communities not because of any personal or moral fa failure of the character of black and indigenous people, but socially and systemically, these problems have existed for decades. And in many instances, uh, unfortunately, there have been research and, and studies and, and data to show that a part of it is, is by design, consciously and unconsciously, where we've, we've developed a sort of collective indifference towards those rates of marginalization, uh, economic marginalization of poverty. Why that matters is, well, frankly, when it comes to accessing the, the, the court system or any, uh, any system where major decisions are being made, it takes money, frankly. And we also have governments that have uh, unfortunately underinvested in legal aid supports to sort of close that gap. And so you have tremendous numbers of families and individuals who are not getting uh, the proper uh, legal guidance or systems navigation support when I say systems navigation, just understanding the steps of the system. If you do X, or if you take X position and Y will happen and, and following folks, families and individuals through that. And so a major barrier, uh, I, I, or major barriers I would identify as, as those, again, the, the rates of poverty that we're, we haven't been aggressive as a, as a society about uh, addressing by creating more uh, socioeconomic well-being for indigenous and black communities. And then secondly, a, a uh, underfunded uh, an overly expensive uh, justice system and, and legal aid uh, being a big part of that. Not that legal aid is the problem, legal aid not getting the support it needs to properly support these indigenous and black families is, is what I'm pointing to. Thank you, Anthony. Constance, we would love to hear from you if you have some thoughts on what are the barriers the significant barriers that you see marginalized youth facing in the justice system, specifically indigenous and black youth. Oh, thank you very much for bringing me into the conversation. Um, I'm going to speak from an indigenous lens. And if we could understand that the issues of mental health stability, food security, housing security, all those societal mores plus intergenerational trauma. Um, I think that we need to find solutions in carrying the knowledge of all these uh, societal influences. 
and coming to a place of understanding, you know, through that document, The Truth and Reconciliation, and through the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls uh, report, these are two uh, documents plus unpacking the Indian Act that are vital to moving forward and reinvigorating the discourse of how we create change in our justice system and with an understanding and an appreciation that long before white settlers had first contact on Turtle Island, we as the peoples uh, had our own bodies of governance, which Maggie is uh, an authority on. She uh, is an educator and an authority on these matters. And uh, this should be brought into the dialogue. Uh, we had our own language. We, we followed those uh, 13 moon, grandmother moon teachings. We followed those seven grandfather teachings. We spoke in our languages. We traded and had treaty treaties one with one uh, indigenous nation to another. We traveled and traded and hunted uh, across Turtle Island. And we had our own civilization, which was disrupted. We had our own belief systems. We had our own justice systems, uh, which worked uh, and which are circular and which involved not only the whole person, but all persons involved that they have equal say. And they were overseen by medicine uh, people and by elders in a community. Uh, and I think that's a very important missing ingredient in these discussions. And that it's the elders who carry the wisdom of the community and the knowledge of what went before uh, understand the family constellations, understand the disruption and disenfranchisement, and should be a strong part of conversation. This is true reconciliation. And then too, by the same token, I think that people who are hearing and uh, that, well, first of all, there's no excuse for not understanding the histories, the Black histories as well. And I do beg your pardon, Anthony, I can't speak intelligently to Black matters, although I stand with uh, Black Lives Matters and stand strong. Uh, I can only speak in these ways about Indigenous people. That um, it has, the justice system is a colonial structure. It doesn't account for our traditional ways of being, our traditional ways of understanding family and mental health and uh, health in general. And I think these things have to be brought into the discourse. And I think for people who haven't understood or heard these things and may feel traumatized by the learning of the truth of what took place on Turtle Island uh, uh, through colonialism, have to be supported and helped uh, not to linger in thoughts of maybe guilt or shame for what uh, their ancestors did, but uh, to come to the table with a full understanding and appreciation and the knowledge of what took place, ready to um, participate and stand together with Indigenous and Black peoples as allies, as human beings. And I think it's an, this is not an academic process. I think the academic knowledge is vitally important, but this is a process that demands that you bring all of yourself it's a personal, it's personal. And it's a personal commitment of body, mind, spirit, uh, and emotions that they be in balance. So that, that's the energy that comes to the table. That's what will invigorate the discourse. And that is what will create the change in our justice system. So I appreciate and thank you very much that you allow me to uh, join and participate in this conversation. Miigwech. Thank you, Constance. So Constance, you bridge a really important um, topic in terms of how can we as a society create a culturally responsive justice system? And this is a question for, for Anthony and Maggie. So now that we've identified those barriers, how can we start as a society to create a justice system that keeps questions of identity 
and diversity alive in its rules, processes, and personnel. Maggie, do you want to go ahead first? Or sure, I can start. I mean, certainly for me, there's sort of two things that I, I can think about that would improve the system. I mean, I think one thing is think about whether for Indigenous communities, and particularly for matters that are not serious matter, criminal matters, which is the vast majority of things that I would uh, say that people are getting involved in, I, both as children and as youth, like what business does the Canadian state have in community matters that are occurring on reserve? And why do we feel as a, as a people compelled to impose our justice system on First Nations communities? As Constance had said, I mean, there's been obvious, obviously First Nations people had systems of policing and justice and, and accountability to their communities that have operated forever. And it, it's very clear that the way that they are currently operating are not working. And so to me, I mean, I think re, the ability to sort of reinvigorate traditional justice systems, particularly in, in you know, on reserve and closed communities, but there's examples of these in Toronto uh, or in urban areas where, um, you know, we have Aboriginal Legal Services runs a community council, which provides accountability to the community for people accused of crimes. And, and just generally sort of maybe acknowledge that maybe we don't have a lot of business as the Canadian state policing what happens. Certainly many, many of my First Nations clients don't, uh, traditional models of policing and justice just don't resonate with them. And frankly, are ap they are apathetic and not responsive to those systems. And so to me, that kind of brings me to the second point, which is like, I think it's important when we are, if we are going to design systems and impose systems on people um, and communities, you need to think about designing those systems in a way that listens to what their values are, in a way that listens to their hopes and aspirations, and in a way that's informed about where they're coming from and the histories that they have, um, you know, sort of brought them to this point. So one of the things that Constance talked about was trauma. And I mean, that's a hugely important aspect of what is happening all through Indigenous communities in my experience is there is still experiences of trauma um, every day, ongoing every day. We as Indigenous people are watching an experience of trauma happening right now in Halifax and, or sorry, in, in Nova Scotia, as we watch, you know, people that we think are cousins or brothers and sisters or people with whom we have, um, you know, a, a sense of community connection be victimized for exercising their rights. And I think the whole system is very uninformed with respect to how that affects people and how, uh, how that brings them to, into a system and how it affects them sort of on the way trying to help them or get out. So I think listening to people, thinking about trauma and, but also just like deciding maybe it's time to butt out. Hi there. Um, uh, yeah, I would, I would echo the same. So there's it, what I, although Maggie didn't use the words sovereignty, I think that's a, that's an important, um, concept for this work. So sovereignty as in communities being able to, uh, not just, uh, govern territory, but the, the ongoing of their, uh, experiences. Uh, when I think about Black communities, the notion I think of similar and related to sovereignty is self-determination. For Black communities, how do we support systems that would allow Black communities to play a bigger role in providing their own community supports and alternatives to the, the major, the, the justice system? Because uh, if we just look at, uh, on the facts, this is not helping. These systems have not been helping Black communities. They've been disrupting Black communities for, uh, for centuries. Canada, uh, many Canadians are still coming to learn that Canada had uh, a history of enslaving people of African descent. And that history lasted for some two centuries, uh, more than two centuries actually. And, and so Black people have been uh, quote unquote free on the land of Turtle Island for, uh, for less time than they were enslaved on these islands. And so there's on this on Turtle Island. And so what that means is that there are generations of socio-systemic discrimination and violence against black communities that we haven't been given the opportunity to fully heal from. And so if we want to 
think very concretely and directly about what, what can be done to shift things. I think about um, making it a priority uh, within, our, uh, within our society, but of course, very specifically within our justice, justice system, a priority to rectify the historic injustices and systemic racism faced by indigenous and black communities. And when I say priority, I don't mean just, just naming it, but if you look at the budgets of our governments and our organization, that tells you everything about what is actually prioritized and what's not. And as far as we've seen, there has never been a, a meaningful prioritizing, uh, all things considered, of um, supporting Black and Indigenous youth uh, in, our, in our justice systems. I also think about people. Um, so who physically is operating within those systems? Who is leading them from front lines to the, the highest levels of, of systems? So within the justice system, that's uh, everything from crowns to, to judges, to two lawyers, uh, to clerks across the board. We have so many people who are just not from the lived experiences and realities of indigenous peoples who are having such a disproportionate impact in, in deciding on those lives of black and indigenous folks. Uh, and so we need to change that. Uh, when I think about people also, I, I think about also, uh, as, as Maggie was flagging, making sure that black and indigenous people are the ones who are meaningfully informing policies and practices and, uh, and also evaluating outcomes to make sure that these systems are actually being responsive to them. And that uh, also makes me think about policies themselves. When we look at what is on the books, when we look at uh, what, what is identified as what should be known, understood in the competencies, so the skills and talents that we need to develop, rarely is being able to um, operate in an anti-racist way seen as a corporate or organizational or uh, institutional priority of the justice system or the child welfare system, the education system and housing in, in politics, media, it's not seen as, as valuable. And so we need to reshape our policies in that way as well. Thanks, Anthony. I, I do wanna get to, uh, to about two more questions probably before we move on to uh, the questions from the attendees. So attendees, if there are any questions, it's a good idea now to start putting them into that question and, and answer um, function on Zoom. But how can we reconceptualize and restructure the current system um, that criminalizes and controls young people and fails to engage them socially? What are the ways that we can reconceptualize the system? And I think Maggie and, and um, Anthony, you've touched on important issues, which is, you know, having, listening to the people, taking a step back, um, having people who are represented from those communities actually making decisions. Uh, is there anything else that we can point to um, that you can think of? I was gonna say Anthony should go first, just cause I don't have a, <laughs> um, I mean, I, do, I think those things, like I think, to me, it's it is a lot about what I've already said. Like it also with me, it's sort of really you've got you've got me on a kind of burn it all down day. So like some days you get me and I'm like, oh, like here are some very sort of like practical solutions. And then some days you get me and I'm like, I'm so frustrated with the world today. So it's a, I'm a frustrated with the world today kind of person. And so I mean I I think empathy is something that's just missing from most legal systems generally, is the notion that we're like humans and that we should be trying to deal with each other on a human basis and understand one another. Um, and I think generally, like, we probably really need to rethink whether or not this, like any kind of notion of, of um, punishment is something that's actually going to work for systems in the first place, right? Uh, but I think as long as we have a system that is being designed largely by like the overculture by by people who are non marginalized and is intended to sort of exert social control over people to make them into a mold of people that looks like that overculture or to try to force a mold of people that looks like that overculture. It's just not going to work in this kind of society because we're not there's too many different kinds of people with too many different kinds of experiences. And so you know, if you get me on a day like today, I just, I do kind of think you sort of have to start at the beginning and think about really radically changing how um, we conceptualize 
how we serve people. And I think that that's not about necessarily criminal courts generally. I think it's about prioritizing um, children and youth, prioritizing families, um, really thinking very seriously about economic equality. So like, these are the kinds of things that, um, you know, the defund the police people are talking about, which is like, think about where we want to spend our social resources and divert some aspect of those into a situation where people are permitted to, you know, in a very real way, realize their human potential and grow up in loving, well-resourced homes where they feel supported emotionally. And I think that that actually really does solve a lot of problems. It's funny, I think I used to say, you know, it's, it's so hard to imagine how to undo all of these problems, but I'm not sure that it really is. I think it's hard to imagine a world in which we decide that that's gonna be the priority and we're just gonna change it. I don't suggest you can change it overnight, but um, I'm not sure that it's actually too complicated a policy problem. Tapwe, Maggie. I just, I think part of what you're saying, Maggie, is that our colonial system of justice originated uh, to, to give the power and hold the power for white people. And through the ages, it's white people, and then it's middle-class white people, and then it's the good old boys club of uh, middle-aged uh, white men. And uh, none of it has to do with the diversity of nations and the diversity of human beings. And I think you're right, Maggie. Uh, we have to overlay our academic uh, pursuits in justice. And I wonder if it's true for lawyers as they mature that you go through the, you go through. Uh, the faculty of law, you learn the ingredients and the articles and uh, the procedures and you get to practice law. But I wonder if through the ages one comes to realize as, as a legal person that uh, it's not serving human beings. It's serving a colonized system and those pillars of justice that we've built are our uh, justice system do, do not apply. They need to be flexible and they need to be able to change and uh, the dialogue needs to be able to change. Just like culture and our traditions uh, have changed through the ages from generation to generation. I wonder if it should be like that in the law. And that um, colonized structure is so extremely cerebral and linear and human beings are all things. They're physical, emotional, spiritual, uh, and mindful. And to serve a human being, I think, Maggie, you make such a good, strong point about the needs of what human beings for. And again, I'll say food security, housing security, but that emotional security so that they can build up self-esteem. So understanding, uh, uh, human development. I wonder if that, like I, when I studied, I took um, all kinds of psychologies. One of them was uh, developmental psychology. One of them was uh, adolescent psychology. But when I look in a traditional way of our teaching, and I teach and uh, many elders teach uh, human development through the medicine wheel that incorporates all four aspects of a human being. And I'm wondering if that should be part of uh, academic achievement for law students, that they, uh, they are able to touch on that, not as an elective, but as a mandatory part of becoming lawyers and practicing law. I certainly have lots of thoughts about how legal education works. Um, and if, well, I went to law school quite over 20 years ago, so um, it was a while ago. But um, yeah, I have a lot of different questions about how legal education works. And I think ultimately sort of what I would say that I see happening, you know, I have lots of tons and tons of colleagues and friends who are fantastic advocates for um, children and youth. 
and are, you know, doing their best and lots of players in the justice system are trying to do their best, but ultimately they're constrained by what the system has set out for them. There's not, it's always been one of my frustrations as a lawyer is that you're not necessarily in a position really to, to kind of step outside of the system. So there's always going to be a range of choices that are available to people and a range of choices about how we deal with people, but it's not a, it's not practicing law isn't like a transformative thing necessarily where you're sort of you have to take the system as it is and you can maybe try for very small incremental changes but anthony's laughing he's a newer lawyer he may have more uh he may have more optimism about the profession i certainly don't uh this is <laughs> uh so uh, yeah as as was mentioned when when i was introduced i, I now work at the city of toronto as a manager in the confronting anti-black racism unit and uh, although, yes, I was trained as a lawyer, went to law school and, and practiced for some time, but it, it didn't take uh, long to really get a sense that um, what I suspected about the limitations of the system was very much true. And so there has to be more robust ways to support the well-being of, of Black communities outside of litigation and, and the practice of law, full respect and support for folks who use the law and who continue to participate and fight like Maggie um, and leveraging policy and the intersection of policy and law to do that. And I think that, that's exciting work. I, I did that work for some time and it's necessary work. I think uh, we as a, a society need to be thinking about um, how different people are positioned to leverage different systems of change to better the well-being of the communities that we desire to serve. And for me, uh, at this point in my life, it, it's meant um, working uh, at the city of Toronto in the interests uh, of, of black communities and trying to make that change because by and large, I, I found that many of the folks who are trained, so speaking to um, Maggie's point, um, who are trained in law are trained in a way that perpetuates colonialism. You could be black, you could be racialized, you could be queer, come from a range of different communities, but for you to li literally succeed, for you to get the market you need, you by and large are reproducing your knowledge and understanding of what has actually led us to this social disaster of a reality. And that might seem extreme, but if you look at the pain uh, that Black and Indigenous communities have been experiencing for some time, it, it, is, it is kind of a collective social disaster that we need to uh, rescue our people from. Um, not in a patronizing way or like we are going to rescue them, but we collectively need to rescue ourselves and pull ourselves out of the system and say, whoa, this is just not working and it hasn't worked. The data is showing that it's not working for us, I should say. If you look at outcomes, levels of inequality and disadvantage have uh, actually benefited some, the same folks who, uh, as we've spoken to, part of the common culture, white, middle-aged, say Christian, cis, um, heterosexual men. Uh, and so that they've continued to benefit while everyone who's further and further removed from that profile has just suffered. Uh, and one of the ways in which I think our young people are showing a way out is through the arts, arts and culture, using creative spaces to create new intellectual realities, new spiritual, emotional realities in different ways in which they choose to create and think about themselves. And I think there's a lot of promise in supporting our young people to participate in arts and creative cultures, however that looks across the range of experiences to help inspire uh, greater change. Thank you. We have about four more minutes and I just wanna ask one more question. I listened to uh, uh, the current episode, it was this week uh, with uh, Brad Regeer, who is the first indigenous president of the Canadian Bar Association. And the host asked him a, a question that I thought was great for this discussion. Um, the federal bench out of uh, the 44 judges, 42 are white. What do you think this effect has on access to justice in Canada? And how do you see a way to get a more diverse legal community and a more diverse bench? And we have about four more minutes to talk about that. It's a big one. Um, that's something that I am not, that, that's obviously like a very long-standing troubling problem and I don't necessarily particularly have a lot of great answers to it. I think it's really hard for, um, you know, we're still really in a phase of um, infancy with respect to the advancement of Indigenous people and Black people in the judiciary. 
despite uh, people from both of those populations, you know, having been lawyers for, you know, not that, but for some amount of time, right? There's people senior enough to be judges, but I think also it's, you have to um, consider sort of the barriers with respect to people wanting to participate in a system that maybe they don't already see themselves reflected in, in terms of joining the judiciary and um, the sorts of opportunities that young lawyers are given when, or law students are given when they're coming out that would sort of groom them into a position of envisioning themselves as part of the judiciary and then applying to be judges. But, you know, Black people and Indigenous people, particularly on courts of appeal, are like extremely poorly represented and at the federal court, as you said, um, basically absent aside from one Indigenous justice that I know of. So. Yeah, there's there's been a uh, decades of, of this being a, a challenge in terms of diversifying the bench and diversifying the legal profession. I think uh, in the question about the uh, report on the experiences of racialized licensees that the uh, Law Society of Ontario put out, and you would think that the values of equity, diversity, and inclusion as articulated in that a very big report would be taken up by our profession to say, okay, it's time for change. So that the legal profession can better represent the broader community, but that that hasn't been the case. And so I think if the the legal profession itself is not willing to take bold, um, I think responsible stands on equity, diversity, and inclusion to make sure there are more Black and Indigenous folks, not just in the profession, but feeling supported, welcomed, and advancing in the profession, then we're not going to get the change at the bench. And so. Uh, the, the issues are long-standing, but some of the answers are already there. I think what's lacking to some degree, folks feeling uh, threatened, uh, those who do have a, a measure of power within the system and, and benefit, feeling tremendously threatened and scared that the advancement of Indigenous and Black people means the detriment of folks who are not Indigenous and Black, but there's enough uh, opportunity for our communities to succeed without folks feeling like they're, they're going to disappear off the face of the earth, but the resistance is almost as if they think they're going to literally be disappeared. Um, but that's not the interest of Black and Indigenous communities. Uh, I'm not speaking for our communities, but through a relationship, connection, conversation, it's really just being able to support ourselves in our collective well-being. So I think pulling out some of those solutions and working and, and resourcing uh, Black and Indigenous communities working among themselves and in solidarity with each other, I think is the way forward. I will say um, that in the, just to sort of close off this topic, that in the past several years, and I'm no, I'm no apologist for this government or any government really, um, but in the past several years, and particularly since the newer judicial appointments procedure has come up, this government has appointed so many women and people of color to the bench in a way that I actually find very inspiring and gives me a lot of hope. And so, I don't think that the cause is lost at all. You just, I, I, the people who are making the appointments, I think just have to be deliberate about it. And I would say that they were, they have been quite deliberate about it and it has produced really different results than the same old, same old um, from years past. And so I, you know, I don't want to say like, this is a completely lost cause because I actually don't think that's true. I think if you want to do it, you can do it. Thank you. So. I'm gonna take a couple questions. Hopefully we'll have time to get to about two questions from the attendees. Uh, one is coming from Olivier Schuch, uh, who actually works for CN and is one of our, our supporters. Uh, are you advocating for two separate systems, two separate justice systems adapted to account for cultural differences or one system that would be informed by those differences and better align to Canada's diversity? So I have, a, I saw that question. I've been like trying to read the chat box and I saw that question and I'm glad you answered it be, or asked it because um, I don't think we necessarily have to uh, uh, limit ourselves to the, to the binary of having just two systems. So uh, I think we can have hundreds of systems depending on what the community is and what would be responsive to the community. So recently in the world of child protection and child welfare, there has been uh, federal legislation that has recognized the inherent jurisdiction of First Nations people to control their own uh, justice systems and to pass their own laws, including the system that will support or administer those laws. 
And that's something that is really possibly very transformative because it allows each nation, in, each First Nation in Canada, theoretically, to come up with its own law and administer its own law about the children that come from there. And that's not two systems, that's possibly hundreds and hundreds of systems. And I don't, is it expensive? Is that gonna be expensive to do? 100%. Is it gonna be more expensive than the current model that ends up churning people through systems and potentially incarcerating them their whole lives? To be seen. So I, I don't think that we have to limit our imagination. I think that that's a really, it's an imperfect law, but I think that there could be great things that come out of people exercising their jurisdiction there. I would like to say, thank you, Maggie, that's well put. And I would like to say that uh, this is happening now, which is what makes this discord course uh, so important. This dialogue will invigorate our justice system to make it fluid enough to accommodate real human beings and their cultural cultures, their languages and their traditions. And uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. I know there's another question, but quickly I'll add, it, we're already seeing, there's still change to be done in the space of education, but we have seen that sector change. There's people who homeschool, there are specialty schools for uh, children in the arts, folks who are interested in, in, in tech, there are uh, sports focused schools, there are Afrocentric schools, there are triangle schools, there are all these different systems of education that respond to the different needs of the ways in which young people develop. It frankly seems that it's just the justice system that's just holding on to this sort of one size fits all you must conform into this, this ways of processing um, for quote unquote justice to be realized. But uh, the, the education system is not a perfect system, but it's one space you can look to that does have tremendous power in our society that has said, well, maybe we need to be more uh, dynamic and fluid uh, to be able to properly support the well-being and outcomes for young people. I think uh, we, can, we should and need to see the same thing in the justice system. Agreed. We have one more question from C. Wilson. Another great question. Are there examples of projects that are working successfully towards designing or facilitating better systems that you can speak about? Sure. I mean, I think I did, I, I sort of spoke now that First Nations, lots of First Nations are in the process of trying to re-think uh, child welfare and how that's delivered in their communities. But I do think in the criminal justice um, sector, there's uh, Aboriginal Legal Services has a variety of different programs that work within Toronto to work with the system in a way that doesn't sort of deliver up or serve up the sort of traditional punitive system. So people, the community council system allows people to go before community members um, it, who will then sort of determine what the disposition will or will determine a course of action for this person to try to rehabilitate them, connect them to their culture, seek treatment, find housing, do a variety of things in order to um, get somebody back on track. And I think that that's a system that works really well. And there's, you know, that, that repeats itself. There's all kinds of different courts um, across Canada that are attempting to invigorate Indigenous systems of criminal justice or, or of responsibility, I suppose, to community. And so, yeah, I would definitely encourage people to kind of look at the, at the words restorative justice or the words that it's normally um, the way it's normally talked about. And there are lots of systems that I think are generally quite successful. Yeah, for, for my own part, I, I think about some of the really important and interesting work happening out in Nova Scotia, uh, where uh, folks, she's not alone in doing it, but uh, Professor Michelle Williams, who's a professor at uh, 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 Schulich Law School, which is Dalhousie's Law School, looking at restorative justice practices for young people and thinking about, well, how do we create alternatives for accountability and maintaining community safety uh, and how important that initiative is, or those initiatives are and those principles to make uh, black communities more actively involved in determining those outcomes. But then in thinking uh, in, in Toronto, and, and I've also seen some of this in, in Montreal where there are high populations of black communities, is thinking about what are referred to as rites of passage programs where you might have young people who've been involved uh, with the justice system 
uh, either as perpetrators of negative activities or, or uh, victims, but seeing how we can reconnect young people with their culture so that they have, a, as in thinking about different African cultures and practices and values to reshape how they see themselves so that can reform or, or, or change how they interact with the world so that they can see themselves as people who can be more than the racist stereotypes that often tell them that they can only be gangsters or they can only be uh, athletes or they can only be uh, musicians or, or, or things of that sort. It's really opening their minds and their imagination to recenter them in what their actual heritage and culture is. And so those are two examples that I think of rites of passage programs and, and also the restorative justice initiatives, um, African Nova Scotian uh, restorative justice initiatives in, in, uh, in Halifax, or sorry, Nova Scotia. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of the panel discussion. I want to thank Anthony and Maggie for speaking from your heart and speaking so passionately. You have so much knowledge to give all of us and I feel lucky that we could all be here today and, and listen to both of you and Constance as well. Um, thank you for sharing with us. Uh, Thanks for having me. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for having me as well. And now I'll, I'll introduce our next speaker who is Justice Jody Lynn Wadilove. Justice Jody uh, Lynn Wadilove. me, I'm, I'm so sorry. Oh, good afternoon, Justice Wadilove. It's a, a pleasure to see you. I'm sorry to interject. I have to leave uh, Shalane as I have a, an appointment. I have, and I have to travel to it. So, um, before I part ways with you, I want to thank each and every one of you. And uh, to say that this is the tip of the iceberg, I look forward and I have great optimism uh, in the future. I look forward to hearing all peoples in this uh, conversation who have joined us today to have their input and to learn and grow from them as they bring in their ideas. That's what vitalizes uh, and creates a change. So uh, I have to say to you, Bama P, till we meet again. Thank you, Constance. So as I um, was saying, uh, we are here at the height of the attendees. We had 98 people watching this, and that is a huge accomplishment for the legal profession and for our communities in Canada. So I thank you everyone for, for staying on and, and listening and being open. Uh, I do wanna say that uh, I feel very sad about what's happening in, in Nova Scotia. And we stand in solidarity with the Mi'kmaq people there in the fisheries. Thank you so much uh, to all our panelists and if you have any questions or if you want to learn more about Level and the work that we do, please feel free to visit our website at leveljustice.org. You can also send me any questions, shalan at leveljustice.org. Uh, if you wanna get more information or you just wanna talk about what you heard today. And thank you again to our supporters, CN, Tories, Blakes, Goodmans, Enbridge, Weirfolds, and Krista Hill and Linda Plumpton, thank you so much for your support. That's all we have for today. We hope to connect with you again in the future. Thank you.